Thank you for coming. One of the first questions I'm usually asked is what he was talking about, why I decided to write a biography of Madame Chiang Kai-shek. My first two books were about royals, a granddaughter and a daughter of Queen Victoria, who lived in Romania and Germany. Why would any writer in her right mind jump from Europe to Asia, from transparent Western ladies to mysterious Chinese? The explanation goes back to my life with my late husband, Alan Pakula. Sorry about the pronunciation, it is Pakula. Uh, who was working on a screenplay of Doris Kearns Goodwin's No Ordinary Time, a brilliant book about the Roosevelt White House. We'd been having one of our usual dinner conversations about our work, i.e. neither of us listening particularly carefully to what the other one was saying. <laughs> when Alan told me about the time during World War II when Madame Chang was staying at the White House, although there were phones and call bells in her room, when she wanted something, she would always go to her door, open it, clap her hands loudly like this, and expect the servants to appear. This was the way they called the coolies in Shanghai, but you can just imagine how this went over in the ultra-democratic Roosevelt White House. <laughs> Why, I wondered, would such a highly intelligent woman looking for American money to arm her country do anything so counterproductive. I was going to find out. First thing I discovered in writing about Madame Chang is that it required a whole new approach to research. Famous Westerners often make provision for the reputations they leave behind them. And European royals know that they have to pay for their perks, their limos, their planes, their ceremonial carriages, jewels, palaces, and privileges. Because of this, they're very careful to leave diaries and letters, paper trails to their lives and their accomplishments, all of which are then carefully coordinated and kept in archives after they're gone. Chinese luminaries, on the other hand, seem to feel no obligation to talk or write about themselves. As a matter of fact, they seem to say as little as possible. I suspect that it may be considered bad taste, although no one has ever really confirmed this for me. Madame Chang herself refused to see me and had obviously instructed her family to follow her good example. But I was told that the odd relative might be willing to speak with me after her death, which came in 2003 at the age of 106. The niece and nephew who were kind enough to talk to me were extremely nice, utterly discreet, and appropriately non-informative. <laughs> there was another complication in writing about Madame Chang the question of language. I've never tried to learn the language of the subjects of my books. I figure you could spend seven or eight years learning a language or writing a book, but not both, particularly not at my age. Happily, both Marie of Romania and the Empress Victoria of Germany were born in England, and God bless them they wrote their diaries and their letters in their mother tongue. As to Madame Chang, a great deal of what I needed was also in English. And when it came to material in Chinese archives, I was fortunate enough to find a graduate student through the friend of a friend, a young woman who lived in Shanghai and did not automatically spout party dogma. Without her, I could not have written this book. You'll probably notice, if you look into the back pages of The Last Empress, that I ended up consulting quite a number of archives in order to write it. By far the best source for information, however, was the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. 
My personal theory is that most right-wing governments leave their archives to Hoover. My experience with Hoover goes back to my first book, The Last Romantic, a biography of Queen Marie of Romania. This was a long time ago. Alan and I were living in Southern California. He was directing all the president's men, and I went up north to see the son of the Romanian prime minister who was working at Hoover at the time. At that point in my life, I'd written nothing more than book reviews and pieces on blue jeans and shopping bags. So I was amazed at the cordial reception I got. Oh, Mrs. Pakula, we're so happy to have you here. We apologize for not giving you the first class tour, but Governor Reagan is here today. Now you know how long ago it was. Here, let us show you Goebbels' diaries. Why were they treating me so well? I worked there for about a week or two, got ready to leave. As I was walking out, the powers that be stopped me. Mrs. Pakula, Mrs. Pakula, it's been such a great pleasure having you here. Do you think you could get Woodward and Bernstein's papers for us? <laughs> The list of archives credited in the back of my book on Madam, as she was called, is ridiculously long. Trips and letters to the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the FBI, the CIA, need no explanation. But what I discovered early on was how many universities around the United States have material on Madam Chang. It took a while before I realized that there were dozens of what are called China hands, diplomats and journalists who for various reasons specialized in China and who all left their papers to their home universities. My favorite was the diplomat from Cornell, a fascinating guy who worked at least part-time for the intelligence service and who'd left a couple of pictures along with his extensive notes. In one of them, Madame was standing next to a doorway, carefully, uh, legs, carefully posed in the old Hollywood style, you remember the knee, the knee bent and the thing. The diplomat had put a note on the photo for his editor. Don't, he said, crop the ankles. Madame Chang was, in fact, famous for her legs, which were lovely. In The Last Empress, I could not resist telling the story of the Cairo Conference, at which she was the only woman present with Roosevelt, Churchill, and her husband, Chiang Kai-shek. Not only did she take over the translations and the conversations when Chiang was to speak, but knowing how limited and inarticulate he was. Madame, who had worn a long Chinese dress slashed way up on the sides, sat there crossing, uncrossing, and recrossing her legs while he was speaking in order to get the gentleman's attention off of him and onto something far more amusing. It is also said that there were some young British diplomats in the back who were neighing during this procedure. I guess I should add here that my late husband once commented that I always write my books about women who are smarter than their husbands. <laughs> Madam was, in fact, extremely bright. Educated in America, she knew just what would appeal to the senators and the representatives she spoke to, and how to get what she wanted for China without seeming to try. Warned about her charm before she came to Washington, President Roosevelt had determined not to be vamped by her. Vamp was one of his very favorite words. And he had arranged to have her sit at some distance from him during conferences he took great pleasure in teasing his wife, Eleanor, who, when she first met Madame in the hospital in New York, had told him how 
vulnerable and sweet she seemed. 